Welcome to the second lecture in the Spring-Summer 2021 edition of GDES 3091, Interactive Media for Web. I'm the instructor, Zach Pearl. Uh, today we're going to be talking about wireframes, why they are a best practice, or they should be, in interactive media and design, and then also how they um, conceptually tie into the design thinking model. What is a wireframe? In essence, it's a two-dimensional illustration or a drawing of a screen-based interface, and wireframes are the lo-fi, so low-definition versions of finished websites and apps. Um, they're usually stripped down, very bare bones, and this is because they're a sketch or a storyboarding kind of uh, stage in the design process and a tool that you give to your client just to be able to visualize what that final design will look like in a very basic way to get feedback and then to uh, you know move on and make crucial decisions about the design after that. So in a wireframe there are four main priorities or, or um, you know objectives that you want to accomplish with that. Um, you should focus your attention on allocation, meaning how are you going to spatially organize your content within the space of that screen. That's very important for the client to understand right away. Prioritization, which in design terms we can think about as visual hierarchy. So how do we know what is the most important content in that layout? The second most important level of content, third most important, so on and so forth. Functionalities, what features are available in the interface? Are any of them uh, super important to draw the user's attention to? Are any of them novel or experimental? Um, and making those kinds of distinctions. And then finally, we get to the 5D aspect of interactive um, design and user experience, which I talked about in the last lecture, which is thinking critically about user behaviors. And then how do you actually show in the wireframe in a simple way again, um, what are the anticipated actions that the user needs to perform? And then where does that take them in the design? How do they get from step A to step B to C to D, et cetera? Um, traditionally, wireframes, as I said, are quite bare bones. They don't include any styling, color, or graphics beyond maybe uh, boxes, uh, lines, uh, some simple uh, button uh, graphics might be uh, a circle or a square with a little drop shadow behind it to make it look more 3D. Um, but beyond that, uh, Traditionally, wireframes are, are very linear, often black and white, and it's just a kind of, um, not a crude, but a, a very minimal way to block out how your content is going to actually be inserted in the layout. Now, this is changing a little bit as there's many new software programs that allow you to create a hi-fi or a high-definition uh, wireframe where you're using many of the assets that are intended to go into the final product. Um, but there's a little bit of a debate happening these days about if that's worth it or not, and that's something that I can come back to a little later. So the value of a wireframe, why make them, this goes for both you and for the client. So they determine the intended functionality. Um, it's really a way to think about scope. What does, your, what does your website or your app need to do? What does it need to accomplish? And by visualizing this in the wireframe, um, then you can kind of be certain that you're making sure it does everything it needs to. Again, prioritizing the content through determining how much space to give it and where it should be located in the interface. This is tied in also with that idea of user behavior. So until you start to block it out in space, um, it's very hard to think through uh, potential users' actions and how they might get to a button or a link or um, you know, how far they'll naturally scroll down um, before certain content gets missed or is ignored. All of those things come after this kind of prototyping phase of just getting things into the space and trying to figure out how, to, uh, how they best look in that space and um, what their spatial relationships are. Um, connecting the site's information architecture to its graphic design. So this is a related point. Um, thinking about the actual amount of information that needs to be conveyed through the website, um, how much text, um, how much other content, images, video, audio, etc., needs to be accessible, and then um, really thinking about um, how is that, uh, like, in terms of navigating through that information, 
what is the most sensible way to do that visually and creating those important cues so that users feel that the design is intuitive to navigate rather than laborious to navigate. And then lastly, a big value of a wireframe is demonstrating to yourself and kind of thinking through the, um, the basic elements of design, how are you going to create consistent ways visually for displaying your information um, and doing it for different types of information. So maybe there's a difference between technical information that's accessed through the website and then maybe other things like you know, just simple uh, labels or headers or even captions for images. Each of those will probably need a slightly different look and feel to it. So this is a good way to explore that in the wireframe before you actually get into the messiness of coding it. Okay, so I just want to acknowledge that this image is a little bit dated, um, but I think it's, it's valuable and it reminds us how crucial the grid is to anything that we do in design, not just graphic design and, and print. Um, but one way to think about wireframes is to come back to the fundamentals of graphic design and print layouts, which use these grid systems as templates to organize the content in a consistent and fractal way where every element is sized and placed in proportion to others. So what I mean by that is that um, here, you know, we have on each page, we have a four column and four row layout with consistent margins. And because even though these layouts are actually different, here we have uh, text moving across three of these columns and here text is split into two groups occupying two columns that because they're aligned at the top and the bottom, and because the other elements that are placed on each page are also obeying the same margins and are also organized in that same 4x4 layout, um, they feel like they belong together and it feels like the information is organized in a clear, consistent, and cohesive way. So wireframes, because we're often working in boxes because of the CSS box model for our elements, um, are a great way to kind of um, flex your grid skills and think about all of the different variations that you can make based off of a simple fractal grid system. So um, individual pages can obviously look different than others while still adhering to the same basic rules of spacing and sizing as determined by the layout. So another great example, image up here, images over here, you know, these are aligned vertically, these are aligned horizontally, but in both cases, still observing that base unit of the rectangle and the margins are consistent as it relates to the text. A good wireframe should allow for both consistency and flexibility so that every page on a website or app looks similar in, in many ways, um, while also being able to stand out and look slightly different. So you want each page to have its own kind of feel so that it's memorable and it's clear that the information there um, is different than that encountered on other pages, but you also want to have a nice theme and a motif that um, a lot of times uh, for the user it's very essential to make sure that they uh, are even on an unconscious level still have certainty that they're on the same site or that they're in the same app. So having a consistent kind of banner um, and a consistent layout at the top, especially the menu is critical in giving people a sense of grounding that they are still uh, you know, operating or navigating the same website or app. Thinking about those kinds of things while also looking for opportunities to, as they say, quote unquote, break out of the grid and um, do things a little differently from layout to layout. And striking that balance is really key and something that you can start establishing right away in the wireframing stage. So here, just to pick up a little bit more on that, um, you can see all of these different uh, thumbnails over to the right that are dealing with the same content and relatively the same kinds of um, margins and number of columns and rows, but looking at all of the different possible variations. So just like when sketching for a print layout project, ideas for how to design a wireframe for a website or an app should go through many iterations and versions. And I really mean this. Um, it's to your advantage to 
really think about all the possibilities, moving content around, resizing and shifting it to explore how to best make use of that space while also creating a visually engaging and compelling composition for the screen. It's important that we remember that these are compositions and compositional theory should be coming into play. Um, an interface is not just a given thing and there are many different approaches to how you do it. So really don't limit yourself to what you've already experienced elsewhere on the web because unfortunately uh, many websites are built off of other people's websites and there's a very kind of template driven mentality to web design these days. So um, really push yourself to look for opportunities to um, to push the envelope of that grid that you're working within. Uh, wireframes often start out analog, drawings on paper or in sketchbooks before moving into more sophisticated programs, which I alluded to earlier, like Adobe XD or Azure, which um, then they can, you know, not only are they digital, but there are many kind of, you know, sleek transitions and animations that can be added that give the illusion of a working website so that the client can better envision um, what the designer's intentions are. Um, just quickly wanted to say uh, or demonstrate here, or I should maybe not demonstrate, uh, just illustrate um, that if you didn't know this already, uh, you know, grids are in use already on in the design of websites and across all of your different devices. And actually, um, grids are super important to responsive web design, where we take something that is meant for a much larger device and try to shrink it down for a handheld device or vice versa. So here we can see um, uh, the use of a 12 column grid that's sized down to fit onto a phone. And the, the basis for how it's laid out and we can see this by the amount of um, columns that those different elements are taking up in each, is that there's still a four to three ratio that's consistent across both layouts, even though one is much, much smaller um, and the actual you know, uh, width of pixels for each of those columns is far reduced. So this is another thing to keep in mind while you're wireframing um, and you should be making uh, ideally different wireframes to explore different ways that your content will resize and adjust. So it's not really enough, at least in a professional way, to, um, to design one layout anymore. And ideally, there's a variation that is specific to uh, phones and tablets so that you can show the client that you're really thinking ahead and that some things maybe will just uh, size down naturally and smoothly because you've got you know, a percentage-based layout, um, and you're doing all of those kinds of, uh, you know, uh, good habits and techniques in order to make it as uh, rescalable as possible. But you'll probably also, especially when it comes to images and the amount of text, um, you'll need to bump up the size of text for smaller devices while decreasing the size of images and probably be thinking about how to collapse things so that you're not relying so much on columns on smaller screens. Um, most common are specific wireframes for smartphones, um, but keep in mind that the dimensions of smartphones change almost every year now with newer models. So when you're creating your wireframes and definitely when you're creating your designs, you need to keep yourself informed about what those changing standards are. Um, tablets also offer users really easy, uh, almost intuitive ways to, you know, a lot of people will just flip their tablet. Um, so it's a good idea to be thinking about how your layout, and I mean this in the wireframing stage, also how your layout will change if it suddenly becomes wider. Um, and maybe not as wide or as big as a desktop, but still to think about those minor things that will have to shift to accommodate that. And then lastly, it's really essential to do this in the wireframing stage because if you wait too long and all of a sudden you're starting to build and you're coding, um, you may lock yourself in to certain decisions that become much harder to go back and try and solve later. So it's always best to get it out in the wireframing and prototyping stage. 
Um, here's just a really quick example of a digital wireframe. So this is something that you might make uh, in Illustrator or in InDesign where you know you have access to very simple graphic making tools. You can adjust some color, obviously adjust um, typefaces and the size and the scale of things pretty easily. But you can see that, you know, in place of images, we just have boxes with X's. So those are uh, what we kind of, kind of refer to as um, dummies, uh, D-U-M-M-Y. So they're sitting there awaiting the actual image that will go in there. But at this stage, it's not productive to put them in really because we might need to um, we might need to substantially change this layout later. But what we are doing is representing at least the anticipated amount of text, so we know how much space it's supposed to take up, what kind of links will be in the menu and the footer, um, the size relationships between the different, uh, the different pieces of text, as well as the size relationship between things like the logo and the company name versus the other elements on the page. And again, also thinking about what kind of features we want. So even having um, you know, the search bar in the upper right corner uh, very clearly stated there, we know, or at least we're suggesting to our client here that that feature, um, that's where it should be placed and it should also be very prominent and noticeable. And here's just another example as a variation. Um, this one were, is a little bit different because it includes um, a kind of generic uh, URL bar at the top and some browser navigation buttons. So this is a little bit more seductive for the client sometimes because it makes it feel um, a little bit more real uh, and that it's, it's kind of taking into consideration the aesthetics of the software that the website is being accessed through as well. Um, and here below, I just wanted to point out, um, again, we have, you know, a very simple representation of a button, but it's here also to make it clear that the image that would go into this area is clickable and that it is a, uh, a source of interaction. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to men mention that um, you'll notice that there's some lorem ipsum text, and this is also sometimes referred to as dummy text. And uh, I will be posting a link very shortly if I haven't circulated it already through announcements for a convenient generator um, where you can generate this sort of gibberish text that's really useful just to be able to plug something in. Um, and uh, you need to do that with web design because uh, the more text there is, the more it expands the vertical space of your layout. Um, and so it's not like a book where it's going to stay static. Okay, so what all should you include in your wireframe? Here are some um, common but not exclusive uh, examples. So definitely you want your client's logo or whatever the, the company is that you're working for. Remember to think about how it will look at different sizes and locations on the page, especially thinking about how it might size down or up depending on the device. A header and a footer area, these are the top and bottom sections. They don't have to look a certain way at all, um, but they usually hold the majority of the links for navigation. So they're important to think about the look and feel early on. Um, your menu items, how many do you actually need or will you have? And are your menus all going to be text or will some of them be icons or buttons or a combination of both? Um, any social media links, I think that one's pretty obvious. Um, buttons that are not part of the top or bottom menu and are other sort of calls to action. And what I mean by graphic calls to action is sometimes these will also be just clickable images or videos um, or, um, or animations that are generated through code. So what are those other elements, if any? Search bar, if necessary and appropriate, I put that in there because I see a lot of students including one when it's not really called for sometimes. So make sure that you're adding things that make sense to the concept and what the client is asking for. Um, and then of course, images, uh, usually displayed as the placeholder boxes with an X and your placeholder text. So these are all kind of must-haves. And then if you want to include other things that are the cherries on top, then that is up to you. Okay, so now I want to pivot just a little bit and think about how um, wireframes relate to design thinking. So 
Here's my kind of classic definition. Design thinking is a methodology. So it's a, it's a, you know, a particular, um, a method becomes a methodology when it has a philosophy around it, I guess is the easiest way to put it. So design thinking is a methodology used by designers to solve complex problems and find desirable solutions for clients. That sounds pretty obvious. Um, let's get into more of the nitty gritty here. Um, a big thing that sets it apart is that we actually, in design thinking, we try to stray away from this idea of problems in the first place. So a design mindset in design thinking is not problem focused per se, it's solution focused and action oriented. So it's more about this notion of creating a preferred future or how can you, how can you take um, or how can you use design to make things better for everyone involved, the best possible solution, um, rather than thinking about the problem itself. Um, as part of the ideation phase in design thinking, wireframes play a big role um, because of what I'm about to show you, um, because they really do force a cyclical motion or a cyclical way of thinking about the design challenge at hand. So here is a, I'm borrowing this from the Interaction Design Foundation, um, which you can see their URL at the bottom. And this is a mapping that they've done of design thinking, and they've already noted that it's a nonlinear process. So let's just go through this quickly. Um, usually we actually start here on the second stage by just trying to define what the problem is in the first place. And from there, then we move into an ideation phase where we start to identify possible solutions. And as we identify those, then we mock them up and we make a prototype. And then we move into a testing phase, but then the process isn't over from there. So then we actually cycle all the way back to the beginning, because in order to test our design, we need to know something about who's going to be using it. So we learn about our users through testing. And then hopefully, as we do that, we begin to empathize with their needs, actually be able to feel the kinds of things that they are feeling in the interaction. And this helps us to further better define the problem, which leads us to even better solutions or ideas for solutions anyway. And then we have this sub cyclical motion as well on the bottom where we ideate and then we learn from the making process and this may actually influence our design the most and then we still move into testing testing reveals or tests reveal insights that redefine our problems so there's a lot going on in here but i just want you to concentrate on this notion that wireframing encapsulates really all three of these kind of final stages of that nonlinear process where um, it does all three. We begin a solution by visualizing it through the wireframe and we prototype it by actually mocking it up and then we test it when we introduce it to the client. And then from that feedback, we learn more about our user, but we also get new insights to redefine what the user sees as their problem or challenge. Um, or again, in design thinking, we would think about their desired solution or preference. So wireframing is really important to um, making sure that this process is as thorough and as creative as it can be. And design thinking is more than visual thinking. It really is a philosophy for looking at the world and how to um, be resourceful and innovative and improve the world around us. So I just want to end with a couple of quotes. And this one is very short, simple. It's a little cliche. Design is how it works by none other than Apple founder and longtime CEO Steve Jobs. And as many of you will probably know, Steve Jobs was not always the um, nicest person. Um, he was a bit of a tyrant but he was an amazing um, uh, sort of futurist. He really thought about design as a way for humanity to move forward and not just as a thing that makes, look, makes other things look 
pretty. And so what he's trying to stress here is that design is not how it looks, which is usually what people um, attribute design to, is that it's cosmetic or it's aesthetic only. But design is actually how something works as well, because it needs to comprise both form and function. So when we think about a process like design thinking, we're also thinking of uh, how to design an experience and how to design something that is functional and can be used as a tool and also hopefully looks amazing and um, gives us all kinds of um, you know fun innovative visual feedback so we have a good time while we're using it. And then lastly I wanted to show a quote by April Griman, an American uh, graphic designer who was one of the first in the 1980s to embrace computer technologies as part of uh, the design tool set. And she was actually an early user and pioneer of Photoshop before it was really uh, widely used by many graphic artists and designers. So she said, design must seduce, shape, and perhaps more importantly, evoke an emotional response. And I bring this up finally uh, at this point in the lecture because as I said, design thinking really strives for empathy. So even in the wireframing stage, it's important to envision who your potential users are and to anticipate their behaviors, but also, um, you know, they're, they are humans, their emotional needs and their emotional responses possibly to what you're making. So even though you're at this stage kind of pushing around little boxes within an imaginary space, um, do think about the human beings that are on the other end of that and what they expect and what they will want out of what you're designing. And then the other thing too is that when you hand this off to a client, it should evoke an emotional response. So even though it is very, uh, yes, streamlined and um, if you go the lo-fi route, it's not going to be super visually exciting, but you can do quite a lot with um, black and gray and lines and boxes and little placeholders. Um, if it's if it's well organized and it feels like it has a vision and a point of view behind it, uh, it still will come across as beautiful in its prototype stage and hopefully evoke an emotional response from your client as well. Okay, well that's all I have for wireframing and design thinking right now. Um, good luck with your uh, reading responses and I hope that this lecture has been helpful.